Hands of My Podcast is a proud member of Dark Cast Network, presenting the brightest of indie podcasts. Imagine a world where every missing person is never forgotten. A world where families have the support and advocacy they need to find their loved ones. Welcome to National Missing Persons Day. On February 3rd, 2024, join us in San Antonio, Texas, sponsored by Search and Support San Antonio, as we unite to raise awareness and support one another. This special day is dedicated to displaying the cases of missing persons, keeping their names and stories in the public's eye. Families and attendees will have the opportunity to connect with one another, share their experiences, and find solace in a community that understands. Hi, my name is Jasmine Castillo, and I will be present at the National Missing Persons Day event, providing on-the-spot podcast interviews and offering support to both the families and the public. I am honored to be part of this event, and I invite you to join me. National Missing Persons Day event is not just about raising awareness. It's about taking action. By attending, you become an advocate for these families, sharing their stories, and helping to bring lost loved ones home. So mark your calendars for February 3rd, 2024, between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. Central Standard Time at the American Red Cross, located at 3642 East Houston Street, San Antonio, Texas. Together, we can make a difference. Let's honor those who are missing and build a stronger, more compassionate community because every single missing person deserves to be found. For more information, please visit the websites or contact me at 903-883-6103 or email Hands off my podcast at gmail.com. See you there. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo, and I bring stories and cases from the people of color community, bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black Indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So, welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. I was currently going through my emails, specifically the ones from Sydney M., who is associated with Speak Her Truth True Crime Files. Sydney has provided me with a multitude of story suggestions, and I must say, there are so many of them. However, I am relieved to discover that some of these stories have had positive outcomes and the missing individuals were successfully located. And on the other hand, some cases unfortunately haven't had the same fate, and these individuals remain missing or have gone cold. Kendra Nicole Botello is considered one of the five Garfield County, Oklahoma City cold cases still unresolved as of today. A woman who was last seen knocking on a stranger's door remains missing for more than a year after she disappeared. Kendra Batello last had contact with her mother at approximately midnight on July 7, 2022. Police in Enid, Oklahoma stated that the 24-year-old last movements actually span a few weeks. This is Kendra Nicole Patello's story. The search continues for Kendra Batello, who hasn't been seen or heard from in nearly two months. Her family says they're continuing to pray for her safe return and say that they're never going to give up hope. She has a pretty smile when she smiles. It's There's... been 56 days. There she is with a smile. 56 <laughs> days since Lillian Reyes has seen her granddaughter. I miss her. We're 56 days into this mm -hmm. and it's not looking really good. Crucial days, important days have come and gone and, yeah. and you know the longer that we wait, 
the harder it is to find her. Edna Reyes and her family are looking for Kendra Botello. Enid police say they've exhausted multiple efforts to bring Kendra home. Conducted several interviews, executed several search warrants on vehicles, residences, devices, and followed up on each and every tip we've received. You never know what that one piece of information could be that could lead to to helping us find her. While police continue to look for Kendra, all her family can do is look back to the last time they talked. And usually she comes, ask me how I'm doing, you know, Grandma, how you doing? Are you doing okay? But she didn't say nothing like that. Kendra Patello, a vibrant individual, entered this world on August 24th, 1997. Born and raised in Enid, Oklahoma, Enid, Oklahoma is a suburban type of city with a population around 51,000. Enid is about an hour and a half drive north of Oklahoma City. Enid is considered a farm center city, but it actually offers the third largest grain storage in the world. She was fortunate to have been surrounded by a large and loving family. Her mother, her two beautiful children, Lillian Reyes, her grandmother, Edna Reyes, her cousin, their strong bond created a close-knit unit that extended beyond blood relations. Despite the inevitable challenges that life threw their way, Kendra and her family made it a priority to maintain a regular contact with one another. This connection served as a source of unwavering support and an avenue for sharing cherished moments and heartfelt conversations. They traversed life's ups and downs together celebrating triumphs and providing solace during times of hardship. Upholding the spirit of unity and kinship, Kendra's family exemplified the enduring power of family ties. Kendra is described as a girl with an infectious smile, dark hair, and dark hazel eyes. She is part Native American, belonging to the Muscogee Nation. The Muscogee Nation is also known as Creek Tribe. It is federally recognized Native American tribe based in the U.S. state of Oklahoma. The nation descends from the historic Muscogee Confederacy, a large group of indigenous peoples of the southeastern woodlands. Official languages include Muscogee, Uchi, Natchez, Alabama, and Kosati, with Muscogee retaining the largest number of speakers. Historically, they were often referred to by European Americans as one of the five civilized tribes of the American Southeast. The Muscogee people have a rich and complex history. They were once a powerful confederacy of tribes that controlled a large territory in the southeastern United States. The Muscogee people were skilled farmers and traders. They also had a sophisticated culture and government. The majority of the Muscogee people were forcibly relocated to Indian Territory known now as Oklahoma in the 1830s by the federal government during the Trail of Tears. In Alabama, a small faction of the Muscogee Creek Confederacy continued to reside and their offspring established the Porch Band of Creek Indians, which is now recognized by the federal government. Another group of Muscogee individuals sought refuge in Florida between and approximately 1767 and 1821 as a means to avoid European intrusion. During this time, they intermarried with indigenous tribes in the area, ultimately giving rise to the Seminole community. I'm a TikTok scroller, and I've come across history that I just wanted to get to the bottom of. Intriguing fact, I was today's years old, that some Creek and Seminole people owned black slaves. This is especially true before the Trail of Tears, when the Creek and Seminole people lived in the southeastern United States. In the early 1800s, the Creek and Seminole people owned more slaves than any other Native American group. There are a number of reasons why Creek and Seminole people owned slaves. One reason is that the Creek and Seminole people were influenced by the white slave owners who lived around them. Another reason is that they were trying to compete with white settlers for land and resources. By owning slaves, the Creek and Seminole people would produce more crops and raise more livestock. The Creek and Seminole community did not treat their slaves in the same way that the white slave owners did. 
slaves often had more freedom and were treated more like members of the family. However, slaves were still owned as property and could be sold or traded. The Trail of Tears had a significant impact on the Creek and Seminole people. Many were forced to leave their homes and land and move to Indian Territory. This caused a lot of disruption and hardship for the Creek and Seminole people amongst other indigenous communities. It also led to a decline in the number of slaves owned by the Creek and Seminole. After the Trail of Tears, Creek and Seminole community were no longer able to compete with white settlers for land and resources. By the end of the 19th century, slavery had largely disappeared among the Creek and Seminole people. This is due to a number of factors, including the Civil War, the Reconstruction Era, and the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act broke up tribal land and gave it to individual Native Americans. This made it more difficult for Native Americans to own slaves. Today, the Creek and Seminole people are still recovering from the effects of slavery. Many Creek and Seminole communities, as well as other indigenous communities, are still working to heal the wounds of the past and build a better future for their people. Afro-Indigenous is a relatively new term and it is still gaining acceptance in the broader community. Afro-Indigenous is used to describe people who have both African and Indigenous American ancestry. This includes people who are descendants of enslaved Africans who were brought to the Americas to work on plantations, as well as people who are descendants of Indigenous Americans who were colonized by Europeans. Here are some examples of Afro-Indigenous groups. Black Seminole, the Gullop, Lumbi, the Wampanoag, just to name a few. Kendra Batello, 24 at the time, lived in Enid, Oklahoma with her boyfriend Colby Shepard, 25 years old at the time. Colby Shepard is a man with a history and a relationship described as violent. They rented a room from Tanya Dixon Glasgow. I will get to Tanya later in the story. Colby was previously married to his ex-wife, Jessica Shepard. They had shared a five-year-old son. They separated in October of 2019 with allegations of domestic violence by Colby. In June of 2022, Kendra also filed a domestic violence report against Colby. Kendra would be the witness against him as it is her that he had allegedly physically assaulted. And I say allegedly only because this trial would actually never officially take place, not because there was any doubt of Kendra's claim or the police report, which contained photographs. But she had vanished just a few days after he attended a bond hearing about the charge. Kendra's grandmother last saw her on July 6th of 2022 and received a strange text from her after leaving. Tanya accused Kendra's grandmother of stealing her dog and forced Kendra to move out. Kendra seemed different when she saw her grandmother on July 4th, being less talkative. Her grandmother would say that while nothing special is said or done, Kendra didn't seem to be acting the way she usually is and seemed to be acting a little off. She almost always wanted to chat with her grandmother and about how she was doing, but not this time. Kendra is much more reserved and quiet. On July 6th, Kendra saw some friends, but not much else has been reported about this day. On July 7th, around midnight, Kendra called her mother. They chatted for a bit about nothing in particular and hung up the phone. The next few days are a mystery. No one is able to reach Kendra and no one had heard from her or seen her. Her family's efforts to find her were unsuccessful. She was officially reported missing on July 12th. Her family is worried and believes she will show up but ultimately makes an official report to the Enid Police Department. You're probably asking yourself what efforts were made to search for Kendra? Well. Not much. Unfortunately, Kansas are 10 times more likely to be kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered. The crimes rarely prosecuted. Kansas lawmakers hoped a new law would help change that. 
That law's been on the books a little over a year now, so we decided to check in and see how it's going. Be cautious to wear a ponytail because, you know, that they could grab your ponytail. That's what Carol Cadu Blackwood told us a year ago about what it's like to be a Native American woman living in Kansas. We shouldn't have to live like this. Which is why Kansas State Representative Ponkawi Victor's Kozad spearheaded the passage of a new law to address the epidemic of murdered and missing indigenous women and people, at least here in Kansas. The result? Specialized cultural and jurisdictional training for law enforcement officers and concerned citizens involved in trying to find these lost sisters. It makes more sense now why I have to jump through so many hoops to help to find somebody. Nicole Rivas leads a group that helps search for the missing in South Central Kansas as well as nearby states. She was one of the first concerned citizens to take the training. She said the jurisdictional holes she learned about were bigger than she expected. I found that none of them work together, that we have to go to each one of them, FBI, BIA, um, you know, each police department, everything is separate. And then there are the problems when cases cross jurisdictional lines, like the current search for Kendra Nicole Botello, who disappeared from Enid, Oklahoma back in July. Her name still not in the national database of missing persons and other departments can't touch the case just yet. We have working on a case right now that we told them, you know, we believe she's here in, you know, Wichita. Uh, we've been told that she's here in Wichita and they're like, well, we need concrete evidence. Nicole believes if more officers took the new training available in Kansas, some of those hurdles might get easier to cross. I only know of one person in Wichita that's taken it. I hope that I'm wrong on that. But if that's really true, then definitely need to change that. Her family and friends have tried passing up flyers and a few of the local media stations picked up her story with some pushing. Interestingly, a sighting would come in of Kendra from July 20th, a woman in Pawnee, a small town about an hour east of Enid, reported that a woman came to her door asking for a glass of water. The entire communication isn't known, but the next day this woman saw a flyer of Kendra and realized that she is the woman who had come to her door the day prior. It is reported to police and investigated we don't know for sure if authorities believe it is Kendra. Cass Rains from Enid Police Department said they conducted interviews, search warrants, field searches, even used drones to follow up on tips. And during this whole time, the domestic violent case against Colby Shepard was dropped because Kendra was unavailable to testify. Based on her family and friends, Kendra is an active social media user, yet she has not reached out to her loved ones since July of 2022. This is extremely unusual for her. Lily Reyes, her grandmother, expressed concern and mentioned missing her. Law enforcement also announced that Kendra is known to frequent Bristow, Oklahoma, and residents there should also be on the lookout for her. Pawnee is located between Bristow and Enid. Eventually, a press release was issued on August 31st of 2022, stating the following. Investigators have been diligently following up on all tips, leads, served a number of search warrants, field searched several locations, seized potential evidence, and attempted to ping Kendra's cell phone. They've interviewed potential witnesses and tipsters, collaborated with other involved law enforcement agencies, and entered Kendra into NCIC and NamUs database. Investigators said that they also followed up on a tip that Kendra Batello is somewhere in Wichita, Kansas, but that lead is not fruitful. There have been several searches involving residents, people within the community who simply wanted to help and indigenous activist groups lending their voices, but there has not been anything shared publicly to suggest that evidence leading to Kendra's return has been found. They remain in close contact with Kendra's immediate family. Despite all this, Kendra remains missing. Many wonder about Colby Shepard, Kendra's boyfriend at the time. He had recently been arrested for domestic violence against Kendra, allegedly almost strangling her. His history is hard to follow since some charges were dropped, but it looks like he is once again charged with battery on August 18th, 2022. That case looks like it may have also been dropped.
Colby is currently incarcerated, however, for several years on charges relating to drugs, paraphernalia, and receiving stolen property. During my research on Kendra, I came across a post on websleuth.com that provided some potential matches for unidentified skeletal remains found near Sanger, Texas. The description mentioned a young woman between the ages of 20 and 25 wearing a blonde wig with the case number of UP96479 and the date of September of 2022. Sanger is located north of the Dallas Metroplex area and directly connected to I-35. Thankfully, it is noted that Kendra Nicole Patello has been excluded as a possible match for these remains. Additionally, Nazia Lekay Griffin has since been located. Another individual mentioned in relation to this case is Sierra Marie Quintanilla. On January 5, 2019, Sierra was arrested for falsifying her kidnapping, stating that she was held captive on December 14th and was assaulted with a gun. Lastly, Tiffany Nicole Foster is another name associated with this investigation. I will have the link to the form as well as the NamUs link in the show notes. Kendra's friends and family are desperately seeking information about her whereabouts. Her absence has left her loved ones in a state of constant worry and uncertainty. If she wittingly disappeared or if she's hiding from something or if something terrible has happened to her, it has been over a year since Kendra went missing. And the need for answers is only growing stronger with each passing day. Kendra Nicole Botello went missing on July 7, 2022. Was last seen in Enid, Oklahoma, the Enid Police Department is seeking your assistance for any information regarding the whereabouts of Kendra Nicole Patello. Enna Reyes, Kendra's cousin, states, Just come back and come home. Or just call your grandmother or her sisters. Reach out to one of us to let us know she's okay. If she needs anything, she can always call me and reach out to me. I'll be there in a minute, a heartbeat to get her whatever she needs, and most of all, we love her tremendously, end quote. Kendra's relatives did reveal that she battled mental health struggles and substance abuse. The last person to see or hear from Kendra is apparently a stranger on July 20th. Ina police claimed that Kendra knocked on the woman's door in Pawnee and requested a glass of water. What happened to her after that remains a mystery but her family has been diligent in their search efforts alongside EPD. Kendra is described as a biracial woman, also known as Afro-Indigenous, Hispanic, Black, and Native American backgrounds, stands 5 feet 7 to 5 feet 8 inches, and weighs around 115 to 130 pounds. She has black or dark brown hair with brown eyes, also identified in some sources as dark hazel eyes. She has dimples. Kendra's hair is short, but she is known to wear wigs of various lengths and colors. Kendra was 24 years old at the time of her disappearance. She would be 26 years old today. I also suggest in supporting Kendra's Facebook page, which is called, Where is Kendra Botello? Keep her story alive and in the forefront. Let's bring her home. Anyone with information regarding Botello can call Enid Police Department at 580-242-7000 or text EPDTIP and a message to 847-411, case number 2022-6114 and name us, her number is mp 94 Five, six, eight. If you enjoy our show, please rate us on Apple or Spotify. And be sure to come back and listen to us every other Thursday. Until then, this is Jasmine Castillo. We are voiceless no more. Hands Off My Podcast are a proud member of 
Darkcast Network, Uncovered.com, Transdoll Task Force, Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, and partner with Search and Support San Antonio.